way where they already got you, your buying time is solid without any returns. But if you're buying time in this way, it's possible that it will serve you quite well. So for example, they give you your computer back and they say, we want you to give up the passphrase. And you're like, no way. But then you turn it on and then you type in your passphrase, you're done. Right? Because they can maybe, at that point, replace the firmware on your keyboard. If it's a laptop, maybe they've added a back door, which records all the things you type. Right? There's all these problems that can come with it. So you buy yourself time to make smart decisions. And I think that is really useful. And using something like Tor, which we'll get into in a little bit, that also has some value, especially for not being targeted in the first place. But you really have to think about what you're actually trying to defend against. Because if you take that computer and it's turned on and you get busted at Ducati Park with it, you're not going to be, I think you're not going to be in good shape. Right? I think that they're going to be able to do really good forensics work or good at a certain value. So when, when you say deniable or So in TrueCrypt, there's this thing called deniable encryption. And what it, it basically means is that you can tell them one passphrase, and they can't prove that it's the only passphrase or not the only passphrase. So you type it in, and it unlocks the volume. But maybe there's another password that unlocks another volume from the same file. And there's a long-running debate about uh, the rubber host file system and TrueCrypt and systems like it, where they have this so-called deniability. And the question is, if you give up a passphrase, in a system with deniability, how can you prove to them that you gave up all of the passphrases? So in a totalitarian state, I think that the answer is you can never prove that. So I don't use systems with deniability built in. Because what? Because what happens when you use a system and you do give up the only passphrase, but they say, no, no, you have a system which has multiple passphrases. We want all of them. And you say, I gave you all of them. And they say, so you say, you stand in jail. I had this debate with Julian long running. It's actually how I, well, anyway, it's, it's how I've had many, many conversations with Julian following, as we, we, we talked a lot about this particular stuff and, and with some other cryptographers. And there's this question of, if you have deniability built into a product, what happens when the state decides that you're guilty until you prove yourself to be innocent? So maybe deniability works in a place like Germany where they still have the rule of law. But I wouldn't use it in Syria unless I thought I could trick the Assad government into believing that the system only had one passphrase, and I could give them the deniability passphrase, and then they would just quickly kill me instead of torturing me. Right? right? I don't know. Right? It's a trade-off you have to decide. So do you believe that the United States government will act justly if they think they can pull that shit with you? And that's the question, right? And I do not feel confident in the answer to that. I'm actually working on a system that's called MAID, Mutually Insured Information Destruction. It's a MAID because it cleans up after you when you're not around. And the idea is it automatically self-destructs the data so that if you're held in jail, you just have to invoke your right to remain silent, and the system no longer has cryptographic keys. You tell them the passphrase, and it's worthless. It just confirms that it was the correct passphrase, but it doesn't decrypt the data. That's the sort of counter-proposal to that. It doesn't exist yet, though. So maybe the right answer is that TrueCrypt is the best we've got right now. But constantly reevaluating that based on what you're worried about, I think, is the, is the best that we can do right now, is to really to think about that. And for example, TrueCrypt is significantly better, I think, than some other disk encryption <laughs> solutions, especially if the disk encryption solutions maybe send your backup key to Apple. Right? Like, so there are disk encryption solutions that literally, like File Vault on Mac OS, I think it's solid crypto. But one of the things they do is they say, would you like to back up your encryption key with Apple? No. Well, if they're a third party, what happens to your encryption key? Oh, disaster. So there are trade-offs there, right? It probably will not be through math and cryptanalysis that you will be compromised. It will be through everything else, especially how you socially use it. So for example, if you plug your computer into the wall when you type, for example, if it's like um, a laptop, or if you have a desktop computer and it's not plugged into an uninterruptible power supply, there are power line analysis attacks, which someone can do that are so good they can tell the movie you're watching on the television and which television. Dead serious. From the University of Washington Security and Privacy Research Lab, worked by Nero, uh, who's one of my coworkers, he, he has worked on, on this kind of power line analysis work. Well, so here's the thing. You think it's different for typing on your keyboard? Maybe. I don't know. But one thing you can do is if you plug in to a universal power supply, if someone was doing signals intelligence on your power line, if 
you plug into the UPS, you can unplug it from the wall when you type in your really important cryptographic passphrase and then plug it back into the wall, and the buffering stops the signal from being transmitted out of your house. Right, there's like something you've probably never heard before. <laughs> That's like really kind of weird shit. You look really un unhappy. Do I, do you have a question? No, no, the guy, the guy here with the hair. Oh, are you, are you, like, I don't know, you look unhappy. It is hella scary, but like, you know, police don't carry guns too, right? That's way scarier to me, because they're cops. They have guns. Like, that's really scary to me. That's way scarier than all this stuff, right? Because they shoot people as their business. That's what they do, is they kill people. So, you know, perspective is important, because, you know, like, looks like they have something other than guns too, which is also, like, not so great. Um, as an activist, what do you see as like the most likely positive outcome, or um, not outcome, but direction? It's like instead of uh, legal action or legal prohibitions against doing this to us, or or to try to prevent the software and hardware companies from from allowing this to happen, or to I mean, like those would be the two options, really. Right? So the first thing I think is necessary is building alternatives. So part of what all Occupy Wall Street is doing is building an alternative social structure by which to reshape the whole of the United States and really talk about the world. And I think that that is a, a good thing. I think the same thing is true for technology. We don't ask vendors and companies to help us. We have to build alternatives there too. And that's what the whole free software community is all about. And there's a free hardware community doing the same thing. So instead of asking, we need to build those alternatives. And I really believe that that's something that we can all do. And one way to make that happen is for people who are not building those tools, but rather users or wish to use those tools, and make that known that you wish that there was an alternative where you couldn't be wiretapped, where the phone isn't backdoored. It isn't backdoored by default. Or if it is backdoored, it detects that there's a backdoor. So there's a, I want to just quickly give an example before I take some more questions. There's a, oh, hey, I didn't even recognize you back there. That's crazy. Um, so there's, um, there's a thing that's called Osmocom Baseband, O-S-O-M-O or O-S-M-O Com Baseband. It's by a guy named Harold Belty. He's from the Chaos Computer Club. He's like the hacker's hacker's hacker. He's like, you know, incredible. Like, I know God's no masters, but that guy's amazing, right? So um, he built a thing where you take a Motorola telephone that costs $10, and you plug it into a computer running Linux, and you can basically look at the cell phone networks nearby. And another guy by the name of Carson Knoll wrote a piece of software called MC Catcher Catcher. Get it? It catches MC Catchers. So you can sweep the area near your house to see if the police have put a cell phone tower man in the middle device for about 20 bucks. So part of building alternatives is recognizing that the current status quo is fucked up. And detecting that it's fucked up is a big part of it, because also, that means you now have data for a FOIA. You say, hey, I detected a thing that looks like an MC catcher on my SIM card. I plug my SIM card into this phone, and all of a sudden, all of the properties of an MC catcher were present, and now you detect it. And it won't work for everything. So don't feel like if that doesn't happen, if you don't see an MC catcher, that doesn't mean you're safe. Because again, the core of the network is designed to betray you. The whole thing is designed to betray you. The whole capitalist billing system with regard to cell phones is the opposite of, for example, the Norwegian billing system and I think the 70s or the 60s, where they had like a meter that was like a gas meter for making calls. And the phone company was not allowed to write down any of the data about the calls you made because of their experience with the Nazi occupation of that kind of data collection. Well, things have changed, right? And cell phones have really changed that. So like date, time, who you called, and all that. That's now back. But I think, like, for example, with the sympathy catcher, you might be able to sort of fight back even though the whole system is wrong. Right. Because you can say, like, oh, I found the NYPD outside of Occupy Wall Street using an sympathy catcher. How about that? Now, they might just get all the data from all the towers at Zuccotti Park, and then they don't have to do that. But that's a thing you can build at home for $20. It's probably illegal. Who cares? I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> you can build that, and then you can find out if those devices are being used. And it's, it's called... An MC catcher, catcher, I M S I, as an individual mobile subscriber identity catcher. That means that they try to catch your SIM card identity in a GSM phone. This is just for GSM. But so, um, MC catcher, catcher is a project by a guy named Carson Knoll. 
and parallel deltas, the one that wrote the base band for the cell phone, because really,